Okay, so as I said, I was quite intrigued by this theme of the seminar, Flexible Generation, a new paradigm for South Africa and an alternative to baseloadism. Okay, it's quite a mouthful and it confused me initially. So, so I think the gut feel is that this must be relevant and critical for our country. You know, we have to start talking about it and particularly at this time when we're faced with serious electricity supply um, challenges. And not just that generation, but also uh, distribution and probably even somewhere on in the transmission area. But, you know, the, I guess the question for me is exactly what is it that we are or should be talking about? Now, the, the concept of flexible generation, I think, is accepted. But what exactly about it? You know, for me, we probably need to define and or categorize what this means. Depending on your definition, even what is termed conventional baseload plants today could conceivably, conceivably be operated in a more flexible manner. So are we talking about the time it takes to start up and shut down, ability to be run at minimal load, rapid changes in generation output, ramp up or ramp down rates, ancillary services provision, etc. And of course, the associated efficiency and cost effectiveness within which these could be affected. And then we have the term baseloadism. In the title, it's, it's indicated, you know, it's a paradigm. But my question is, is it a paradigm or is it an affliction? I had a look on the, the internet and I see there's a definition there which almost says it's a disease. So, so I, I guess in the room, maybe mainly uh, flexible generation people. But the question is, is it a disease? I mean, geez, it sounds quite serious to me. Now, for me, I had to put some focused thoughts into this topic for the seminar. And... You know, what I could say about it from my perspective is I suspect that the answer lies somewhere in between. And for me, it's not an either or as the, the words alternative to in the, the topic for the seminar uh, suggests. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you would know, the theme of flexible generation versus baseloadism it's, is a very broad, uh, a broad topic. But I, I will attempt to make my comments on this topic from a, a regulatory perspective whilst indicating that the policy imperatives that are not the ambit of the regulator. Okay. So government makes the policy and the regulator implements government policy as specified in the Electricity Regulation Act, Section 4 specifically. And currently the new generation capacity is developed according to a plan and uh, weren't we fortunate that the plan was published last week, uh, Chris? So, um, otherwise we'd be saying, where's the plan, where's the plan? But this plan is based upon a load forecast, and if you go through the document, you'll see that. The other things like availability, but, but you see what you did. <laughs> and the other things that also are considered, such as availability factors, etc. So, you know, this is, the plan is an attempt to achieve an orderly development as required by the, the Electricity Regulation Act. Now, this is because capital expenditure for all of these types of plant is high, and nobody wants to end up with stranded assets, and, and that won't help any of us. South Africa, unlike uh, Europe and America, etc., is effectively an island in terms of the grid. Um, major development of the regional grid is required before the markets that are north of us um, can make a major impact on, on our supply system. I mean, there's a lot of work being done in that area, um, either as a source of energy for us or as an opportunity for us to sell to our neighbors. Now, the new generation plan is developed by government, so let's just talk about that to, to cover the policy stuff. The integrated resource plan and government, you know, it's, it's the, uh, government is the current executor of that plan, so the regulator is not the executor of the IRP. As you know, as we said, the, the Gazette IRP 2019 was published this past Friday, and I think everybody has their view on it. I've seen many different views around. Um, I won't be expressing one today. So Now, it's important to indicate that the current rounds of procurement for generation capacity have been following a, a strict competitive bidding process. Um, now, based on the IRP and in consultation with NURSA, the regulator, the minister is required to make determinations about what capacity, generation capacity is required. It's energy source, who will be the buyer and who will be the procurer. And this is done in line with the new generation capacity regulations. Now, 
Um, I did think about going into all the processes and procedures that NERSA has and what you, hoops you would have to jump through should you be in this process, but I think those are all quite well documented. Um, you know, I wanted to also just stress here that NERSA um, is required. You know, so the minister doesn't do a determination and send it to us and we just sign it. We used to do that. But we actually require it now. We follow a full public consultation process uh, before we're able to determine whether we will concur with what the minister has determined or not. And that's the process that will, will have to be followed for the IRP, this new one that's been published. For generation capacity outside of this process to be licensed, there must be a deviation from the minister, um, or there are changes that have been proposed, uh, a second amendment to Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act, which allows for registration of certain facilities, specifically under one megawatt, um, and that's some of the, and then I think from one to 10, we have been given some direction in the IRP also, uh, but uh, there's a quite a small allocation if you look at that. Um, and this Schedule 2 relates to the exemption to apply for and hold a license. Um, and the minister is, is empowered by Section 36 of the Electricity Regulation Act to amend that schedule to exempt certain types and capacities of plant from requiring a license. But he has chosen in the past to still require registration, which is not always a simple process, although we are trying. Uh, so one of the big questions I think that, that we often get asked and, and probably a lot of people would ask in this room is, you know, rooftop solar, can it and or will it be able to sell back to the grid? So if you're putting in all that equipment, why not oversize it and you've got extra power to sell back to the grid? Okay, and the question is, why can't we do that? Why aren't we doing it? Um, now the rooftop solar less than one megawatt in terms of the Schedule 2 is, is, is really subject to registration, not licensing. Um, but there's a limitation of all of these uh, embedded generation in the IRP. From a regulator's perspective, even though the Munich and ESCOM are able to provide a tariff for generating and feeding back into the grid, that approach would have certain tariff implications across the board should it be effected. So there are tariff structure and philosophy implications given the need for tariffs to be cost reflective and this is recognized uh, internationally. So, the key is that the wires portion of the tariff and the energy portion need to be accurately reflected and recovered to ensure that networks can be properly maintained and operated. It's also an imperative that the poor and other people that don't have the PV, uh, those customers do not subsidize those that have it. So, so that's where you've got to be very careful in how you set up this uh, uh, tariff regime. Now for us, this would be a regulatory requirement and a prerequisite for that feed-in to happen. Rooftop solar installations with storage, though, um, are of greater benefit to all parties, as that would help reduce uh, maximum demand of municipalities as well as the system. But given our seminar theme about flexible generation, now I also have to ask the question, so if you have a rooftop solar system but no storage, can that be considered flexible? Because I think in, in a lot of the stuff I've seen, PV is almost put forward as flexible, but without storage, you know, it's very difficult to say it is flexible. So the, the Electricity Regulation Act provides certain key objectives for the energy regulator to achieve. And one of the key ones for us is that we must achieve the efficient, effective, sustainable, and orderly development and operation of electricity supply infrastructure in South Africa. Now the key to this is the electricity supply infrastructure, which encompasses all of the electricity system from generation through transmission to distribution. So it's not just generation. And so it's not just a simple matter of what kind of gener generation mix is or should be present, um, in my view. This electricity supply infrastructure exists to provide for the load demanded by consumers. So, so I mean, that's where we all start, right? What is the demand uh, and what do people need in terms of electricity supply? Um, and then the load has to be balanced with supply and the network frequency, I think it was mentioned earlier, has to be tightly controlled to ensure stability and quality of the electricity supplied. Generation on the grid must be controllable, predictable and reliable. Otherwise it's chaos. So we know that some portions of load on the electricity grid never disappear and this load has historically been supplied by what is called base load generation, 
as this had been the most economical and logical thing to do. Because so, it was cheaper, it was more reliable, it was also dispatchable, or is dispatchable. <laughs> now, in our context in South Africa, variations in load were supplied mainly by variable base load generation. So, variable, flexible, tomato, tomato, I'm not sure how the, you look at that. Because this was the preferred option, and this was because of economics and reliability. The other required flexibility was catered for with the pump storage, hydro, gas, which is in reality the open cycle gas turbines running on diesel. Um, and the OCGTs were really only considered to be emergency generation. But as we know today, it's used pretty much as part of the system at great cost. So the historic South African generation mix, as well as the national grid, was developed for a certain load profile. I mean, I think if you even look in the, the IRP, you see these graphs that say what is the demand but it would be nice to say what is the shape of the demand and how does it change over time and how do you most efficiently and effectively cater for that. Now, if we had a flat profile, okay, I don't think we'd even be on this topic today because then you just want something that will run flat out. Okay, but we won't go to the nuclear thing. Okay, so um, so the, you know, the, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, I think we would agree, on our current electricity systems is profound. Um, and I was at a, a, another event the other day. We were talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And um, you know, sometimes very hard to understand what that means. Because the technology that we're using and all of the stuff has come from before. You know, when I was a bit younger, a lot of the stuff was developed. But the ways we're using them now are different. And the amount of connectivity, the amount of data, all of that stuff has increased. So with all of that, I think the load profiles, the actual shape of the load, globally is changing. It's not like it was before. I mean, when I worked at ESCOM, we knew there were these two humps in the morning and the afternoon, and the morning one was narrower and, and a bit higher, higher, and in the middle of the day it went down, and in the evening and the early ev late evening, early morning, it was really very low. You know, so you had a lot of excess there, but it's changed. A lot of it has changed. So we all, including me, want an electricity system that is more reliable, secure, sustainable, and efficient. But for us, the basic tenets regarding economics and predictability still need to apply, regardless of what it is that you're going to have in your mix and what type of system. Dispatchability is one of the most critical criteria for a healthy grid, because you must have control. I think the, the, the one thing we're saying with the fourth industrial re revolution is, if you have no control, how do you apply intelligence to anything? Because you know, you're controlling something. I mean, you, you're applying intelligence to chaos. I don't know if that makes more chaos, or chaos theory probably would refute that, but okay. Um, so in, in South Africa, renewable energy generation has preferential treatment currently because it, it is self-dispatch. But as this grows and as we go forward, it's going to have to change, um, and all generation will have to be dispatchable for efficient grid operations. Um, you know, and the te technology that's with us now will allow it because storage is becoming more, more uh, readily available, also more affordable. You know? And what we're seeing is the operational dynamics of the grid haven't changed. And it's going to be the same in the future as it is now, but you will use different tools to, to, to manage it. So you know, there are certain requirements from an orderly development and operational point of view that we must consider, and this is a 24-7, 365 days a year issue. Um, and I think I saw some slides, actually printed one on his shirt, but um, there's, there's a base load, I mean, 15 to 20,000 megawatts of load, which never goes away. You know, I don't know if you all leave your charges plugged into the wall, and do you ever feel it to see that it's actually warm? And if it's warm, it means it's actually consuming electricity when it's not charging anything because it's got some, uh, what do you call it, internal uh, usage in there, in the transformer. You know? and, and as we get millions and millions more of those, plus all these other things like your smart TVs, and it's pretty cool to press a button and it just comes on. And, you know, all of these things, your, your Wi-Fi at home, the router stays on permanently. I assume you don't switch it off when you go sleep and then wake up and switch it back on, and that doesn't happen anymore. So that's going to increase, probably. Now, whether it's one technology or another, is neither here nor there in terms of the grid. Okay, five minutes. Okay, Chris, I think I've got, yeah, that's cool. This, this has to be met with reliable, economic, and predictable generation. 
So flexible generation is required for the variable portion of the load, and like the base load portion, should be dispatchable. However, the same criteria apply. It has to be predictable, reliable, and economically viable. Renewable energy generation coupled with storage can fulfill this role if there's a two-part generation tariff that gives a higher price over the peak periods. But I guess the question is, can it really fulfill the base load generation role? The same criteria must apply to all technologies. Now, NERSA doesn't have a final position on battery storage. You know, it's, uh, but we're exploring the position that battery storage is a generator and should be treated in the same way as pump storage, no matter where it's positioned in the network. And this is because it can generate onto the grid. It can impact grid frequency and voltage, as well as power quality. And there is a special section of the grid code being developed which could cater for uh, this type of plant, and it will come out in 2020 for comment. So battery storage is seen to be very valuable as a new technology that will be able to take its place on the South African grid in due course. It's seen by us as a real enabler that will allow other technologies to play a much more meaningful role in the power grid. Now, in terms of regulation, and we say this quite a lot, the regulator is technology agnostic. What we seek to ensure is that there's an adequate, reliable, sustainable, and affordable electricity supply provided to all South Africans through the most efficient and cost-effective electricity supply system. Now, it's clear to me that a mix of the traditional baseload generation, variable baseload generation, and new age flexible renewable energy generation, coupled with an enabling digital smart grid and connected devices, or what is called the Internet of Things, will be required for the optimal electricity supply system of the future. So from a regulatory perspective, it's relatively simple in many ways. Government sets the policy and the derived electricity plan for the future to meet the needs of all South Africans. As the regulator, we must ensure that the plan is implemented in the most efficient and cost-effective manner possible, and that the necessary electricity system infrastructure is in place to deliver that power from the generators to the end consumer. Investors must also be permitted to earn a reasonable return on their investments with the proviso that the investments are prudent and the plant is efficiently op operated, or the assets. So in closing, you know, the question is flexibilism, because you made the one uh, affliction, so let's make the other one also an affliction. Flexibilism versus, or versus baseloadism. Now, I, th I think neither can be considered in exclusivity. You know, to me, it must be a complementary combination, but I think all will come to naught if not enabled through a digital smart grid because you can't have all of these technologies without the capability to connect them. And as well as connected devices at the consumer level, enabled through the Internet of Things, underpinned by the fourth industrial re revolution. Chris, that might be another topic. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.